for our 42 courses event today, I am so pleased to have joining me Quinton Harris, the co-founder and CEO of Retrospect. He has also been a Can Lion jury president. We're going to have lots of chat about curiosity, creativity, the importance of storytelling. And so I'd like to welcome you here today, Quinton Harris, to this 42 Courses Speaker event. Oh, man, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, hi, Chris. How you doing? Good to see you. Congratulations on your newborn. I uh, heard really good news. I was supposed to uh, say hi to you, but uh, I didn't do it. But yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you so much Absolutely. for joining as well. You're, you're amazing. Uh, good Aww. to see you're still looking even younger than when I last saw you. So. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, you know, I'm trying to make sure I get my beauty sleep and <laughs> it's uh, running a small business, small agency is, it's, it's tough work. So. Bucking oh, yeah. up over, let's crack on. And right. Quinton, maybe for our guests here today, Maybe you can tell them a little bit about yourself, your journey yeah. to how you got where you are today. Absolutely. So uh, Quentin Harris, originally born in a small town called Maywood, right outside of Chicago. So that's like the west western suburbs. Um, you know, bright, bright math and science kid. I actually come from a really creative family, but I thought I was the oddball out, the black, the black swan. So I ended up going to MIT for mechanical engineering. Uh, and while I was there, I uh, I picked up uh, a love for design uh, and uh, and and visual design, specifically architecture. So I dabbled in architecture. I thought I was going to be a double major. I was crazy at the time to think that. Um, but I took architecture courses and visual arts courses and did a lot of graphic design on the side. So I'm very much so self-taught as a graphic designer. And I took a random marketing class my junior year and. Uh, uh, stumbled across a, a, an advertising agency by the name of Digitas, which became the place that I started my career. But I got an internship after my junior year uh, for the summer. And I was a junior graphic designer. And um, the things that I learned, the things I was exposed to, I was hooked. Uh, I said, I, I definitely wanted to be a creative practitioner. Uh, I got a full-time uh, offer uh, to be a junior art director uh, right out of school. So um, it, 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 I, I'd say that was my first miracle of, of many, actually. The first miracle was to go to college and go to MIT. Uh, but I would say that second miracle was to be able to uh, be ushered into the industry um, and have really great mentors and really great creative directors to learn from. Uh, and they saw that I was smart, that I was ambitious, and I, I really worked really hard in the advertising industry for the first few years of my career. And then I jumped ship to go into the tech space. Um, and go in-house to creative teams. So I actually went and worked at a uh, CPG or consumer products and goods startup out of uh, Silicon Valley. And its purpose was really bold. It was shiny, it was flashy. Um, it was uh, a hair and beauty uh, products company that was solely uh, meant to make better experiences for people of color in the States. And it was a really interesting um it was a really interesting career shift for myself because while I was in advertising, um, you know, I oftentimes felt like my story or the narratives that I cared about wasn't really uh, representative in some of the work that I was doing. And I found this amazing company that had this really bold, audacious uh, mission. And uh, it led me to California, where I had to uh, really understand now a new world, which was tech and the intersection between creativity and technology. Um, and that started to become a theme in my career. So I then, you know, eventually uh, went on to be the lead designer for that group. That company got acquired by Procter & Gamble. So I took my talents to another media tech startup, one that was called Blavity. Again, it was very specific to, um, you know, uh, being a media-based company for Black millennials in the States. And then went back into consulting at Publicis for a little bit and then started Retrospect. So... Uh, yeah, my journey has been kind of a winding road of trying to realize, okay, who am I from a skills perspective, but then what do I want to say in the world and what type of impact do I want to have in the world? It's such an interesting journey. I'm fascinated about the architectural background, wondering, you know, what sort of impact that had 
on uh, the way that you approach the discipline. But the other thing that interests me is in our um, Advertising Essentials course, the first video I saw of you talking, you were talking about the future of advertising. Yeah. And now you're telling me your story and so many experiences in these niche agencies. I wonder if what your sort of thoughts are now that agencies are so, you know, we've got big holding companies and uh, I'm really interested to see for yourself how you see this sort of a need for niche niche design and how yeah. that sort of fits under that umbrella of such big holding companies. Absolutely. Um, so I think about my story and I think about um, being oftentimes the person in the room, not necessarily from a race or ethnic, ethnic background, but like the person in the room who just had a very different lived experience and a different way of thinking. And it oftentimes gave me an advantage to really understanding the world that I, or the environment that I was in, but then also understanding how can things could be better? How could things be different? Um, I already think differently, so why not try things differently? Um, and I'd say that um, it was really um, important, especially when I started Retrospect, because I got seed funding from a big, bigger holding company. Mm -hmm. um, they saw my vision and they saw potential in myself and the community that I was bringing together. But it was important uh, because we saw the future of advertising, marketing to be hyper-personalized, but at a, at, a, at a scale, right? So technology was enabling us to have more intimate conversations with people, which means that we have to understand them better. Um, the people that are creating the work or the ads, it's really important that they have some level of connection or understanding cultural competency or understanding of the people that they're talking to so they can present their self, present brands most authentic. Um, and so we were seeing a shift where you had to be agile, you had to be hyper-personal, you had to be very scrappy. And I think my career, I think my trajectory really uh, positioned myself as well as my co-founder and some of the other folks that are in my community to really kind of ride this next wave of innovation, right? So AI is really replacing a lot of the work that I started out learning when I first got into the industry, all of the mundane design tasks, all the processes that were very human uh, centric are now becoming more uh, technologically focused or it, it, it's being more efficient or optimized. So what is the true power that we have in spaces where now technology has become is replacing some of these uh, more mundane tasks? And most of that is your perspective, um, what your uh, what your beliefs are, but uh, how do you make those beliefs actually more inclusive and, and, and uh, facilitate places of belonging for folks? And then like, what is uh, at the heart of human connection? So I'm a firm believer, especially post pandemic, that we are going to crave in-person experiences much more than we had before. But um, because of the trauma that we've experienced during the pandemic, we have to do it in dosages and we have to kind of create these experiences in ways that like we can... Uh, you know, too much in person will be a little overwhelming, uh, but not enough in person will be, uh, you know, not enough. And so we're finding ways to seamlessly integrate um, the in person with the digital. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that only can happen when you have more agile teams, uh, more, I would say, diverse teams as it relates to skill sets, as it relates to lived experience, and a lot more uh, in multi uh skill sets. Fantastic. And of course, uh, as we were chatting before, Quint, and we both know our favorite words are both curiosity and creativity. Yes. Yes. And you are very much of the mindset that anybody can be creative. Anyone can teach themselves and encourage this sort of extra muscle, as it were. Would you maybe sort of talk about that for a little bit? Absolutely. I think I recognized early on in my education that creativity became either commodified or relegated to a very specific profession. Um, we were uh, encouraged to uh, pick a pick a discipline or, you know, study to to excel at an exam 
versus really think about how do we exercise our own curiosity or our own creativity in the world, which a lot of us are born with that gift. And the way we discover the world, the way we interact with the world, um, it's really driven by our uh, need to be curious, but then also our need to be just fully human in the environments that we're in. And so uh, one of the things that I've been really working on over the last few years is practicing what is my form of curiosity? And I, I like to say, what is my rhythm for curiosity? Um, and so I come from, like I said, a creative family, a musical family. Uh, my older brother was an incredible dancer while he was in school. Um, and I really, uh, I started dancing while I was in college as well. But rhythm is so important and really being able to feel music and feel how your body responds to music. I use that analogy um, in how I create. And so particularly for my, um, for my curiosity, um, am I feeding myself things that are enriching and that would cause me to ask more questions? And how do I uh, structure my morning? Specifically for me, I'm a morning person. How do I wake up in the morning, ask myself three questions, right? So how are you feeling? What do you want to learn today? And who do you want to impact today? I ask those three questions to myself every morning. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I go into a space for meditation or uh, sometimes I'll read an audiobook or I, I like to read or like to listen to audiobooks versus read, but sometimes I'll interchange. But I, uh, I start with those questions and then I start to go into the world and try to find what those answers are for that day. Not beyond the day, not I try to, you know, answer yesterday's questions, but really try to be present in that day. In, in, in today. I, I really love that because just that discipline of getting into the habit of saying, what am I going to learn today? Even if, you know, the day's getting on, I presume after a period of time, it's just kind of is present with you all the time and it must drive you then into that, into that direction. So I think that's a really strong habit to have. I think that's great. It, it took me a while. I, I mean, I'd still, I still, I would say I'm not perfect at it, but if I always remember, usually towards the end of the day, if I'm having a really tough day, I remember, what did you learn about yourself today? It's like, oh, so it's about me now. Not, <laughs> not what I've learned in the world, but it's about me. Okay. So I think I learned that my patience was a little low in that particular meeting, or I think I learned that I missed an emotional cue from my my partner and I oh you know like so it's really and, important and those examples me. are so great Quentin because people yeah. often feel that this thing they need to learn needs to be something huge or mm, you know and yeah. it can be the smallest thing so again that's a really really sort of encouraging discipline to think about now the other thing Quentin that I'm really interested in is your experience from Can Lion Festival of Creativity yes when you were the uh, Design Award Jury President. So maybe you'd tell us as well a little bit about that experience, how that came about, and uh, what sort of skills do you think you drew upon to, to manage that team of people? Yeah, it, you know, it was an incredible honor to serve as Jury President, um, particularly of the design category. Um, my career has been advertising, design, a little bit of content. So it's been a little bit of everything, but to um, be asked to be, um, I'd say uh, the high curator of what excellent work is in the world, across the world is just, to me, it's just mind blowing. Um, I had the pleasure of actually serving on the jury the year before in 2022. And I got an insider's kind of um, playbook to how the juries are run, um, you know, the type of relationships that you build with folks from all over the world. And I would say of a jury of 10 folks, you have people representative of every region, uh, which I, I thought was really amazing by Ken Lyons, you know, to be really committed to having representation globally. Um, I would say um, the first year was just, uh, my head was just spinning. I was just trying to take it all in um, you know, really try to use my voice to uh, make sure that the, the, the lens in which we were looking at design, specifically not thinking about just vi visual, 
but thinking about process, thinking about research, thinking about strategy and how all those things come together. I was just trying to be a really great champion. Um, and I believe that, you know, my presence on the jury the first year actually led me to be able to serve as jury president. And I made it some sort of impression, um, I think. Um, and I think right off the bat, one of the things that I learned from the first year was developing community amongst the jurors is so important. Um, we are in some ways a fraternity or a sorority of people that have come together to make a commitment to do right by the industry and to have as much integrity in the process. So I find that like being able to have relationship with each other uh, early on. So I started a group chat um, on WhatsApp with everyone. Uh, we had some briefings where we talked about what is each person's philosophy as it relates to design. How do we include those philosophies? But then how do we um, stand up a higher regard for what we're saying the best design in the world is so that when we're in those judging rooms, we're in those deliberations, we have the utmost respect for each person's opinion, but we have somewhat of an objective lens for how we uh, award the best work in the world. And I think, um, you know, I I'm still friends with both jury sets of juries. We both, uh, we're still in the group chats and, and WhatsApp and um, it was a truly transformational experience for me. Um, and it opened me up to not only seeing the best work in the world and feeling like I had some voice, it also challenged me to say, actually, from where I sit, from the company and within the company that I'm creating, we can do this. We can be the best. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it was it was just amazing. Yeah, that's really interesting. You're talking through the process of managing the team because regardless of the project, all those things you've spoken about are important really for any of the people on the call here today just in terms of making a successful team. So that's really useful. And the other thing I'd like you to talk about, and I don't know if Chris can find the YouTube link maybe to share with everyone on the call of the actual Adlam uh advertisement or not really advertisement project rather that did won won the grand prix i wonder if you can maybe just talk through for the people on the call who aren't familiar with it because it's okay. got extremely high ideals and the fact that it was successful so i'll let you tell everyone about it rather than me oh. sort of <laughs> alluding to it Absolutely. And I, you know, prepared a little bit of something for it. But, Super. Um, yeah. Well, I have was... you got something you want to share your screen on or? Oh, no, no. I was no. just more so in writing. <laughs> Super. Um, no, that's I, fantastic. If, Lovely. If Do you all up. have a video, I would love for you all to play the no, case study I video. I think Chris oh, has okay. managed to share the YouTube. So okay, do excellent. all of you look into that to find out what Quinton is talking about because it's a fantastic project. So, yes, sorry Absolutely. to interrupt, Quinton. Oh, no, no worries. No worries. Um, so we you know, awarded the Grand Prix to the Atlam project by Microsoft and McCann, New York. Um, this project was incredible. It actually is still a winning a bunch of awards in uh, some of the subsequent award shows, um, but it really centered on re revitalizing the Atlam language script of the West African Fulani tribe. So this original language script was created by two brothers um, from the tribe in 1989. And they sought to uh, preserve that history and culture um, within the Fulani culture because up until that point, their language was only spoken, not written. And it was a big deal for uh, the two brothers to actually develop a handwritten script. And over years, they've tried to perfect it and whatnot, but um, they have partnered with uh, Microsoft um, that was their first partnership and, you know, McCann, New York really helped steward that process in a really interesting way. Um, but they partnered with Microsoft to design a font for the script and, 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 and convert it into Unicode so that it made Atlam ex accessible across the world within the Microsoft uh, operating system. And so what it did was it opened up doors for new ways um, uh, to educate a people who only had a verbal uh, um, spoken language um, and allowed them to actually communicate to the rest of the world and be able to participate in the digital and global economy in a way that I don't think I've ever seen a modern like uh, scenario in that way. Um, and so 
Uh, these folks get to participate in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a global system where they can start to create things with their language, with the script, some of the designs that have come from the script and whether it's creating advertising, whether it's creating billboard, local billboards, it's just a beautiful, um, beautiful exercise. And it just really speaks volumes to how design can really enable uh, a more inclusive and participatory world. Um, and, you know, if you, if you've ever been in a position where um, you never, you haven't been seen or you haven't been uh, regarded in, 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 in who you are and, and what you believe in to then have that be uh, expressed at a global, on a global stage, it's just, it's just transformative. So we thought it was a really hard deliberation because there was a um, pro two projects out of Japan that were just incredible. There was another project from the States that was incredible, but this one, we said, no, this one is changing the world. Um, and, you know, great design um, uh, and great champions of design have the ability to not just move forward business, but they, it could change the world. Yeah, and I know in recent years with Cannes, there's been some criticism maybe in terms of people feeling everything's been too purpose-led. But then mm. when you study a project like this within that context, you think to yourself, well, it's, you know, when you can achieve things like this, it's almost irrelevant to criticize, isn't it? Yeah, it's, you know, no, it's it is. pretty enormous. <laughs> and, you know, I understand the criticism around purpose-led because when evaluating design, we are looking at the system. So, you know, I always say design is input, the system and the output, right? It's the whole entirety of the creation. And that's my engineering brain going on. Um, I think it is important to recognize a system that is well crafted, that is well considered, that is, is appropriate for whatever the input or the audience, audience need is and being able to objectively say, this was a, a miracle of design. Like, I think that's really important. I think uh, when talking about greater good or talking about, you know, hot topic political issues, it can get a little convoluted as so well, but was the system really good? You know, was it really considered? And I think also it can get a little uh, divisive when you have design only relegated as the visual aspect of the output uh, or the or the system, where visual is important. Semiotics is uh, or uh, yeah, semiotics is important, but semantics is important as well, right? There's a balance between art um, and function and form and function and things of that nature, and you have to consider the totality of it. And um, to have the impact that this project had on top of the beautiful system that was created was just icing on the cake. Fantastic. That's lovely. I can see a quote coming out of that with the semiotics, semantics, and totality. It's lovely. It's ticking all, ticking all the boxes. <laughs> now, um, another thing that I'd love to talk to you about, and you did kind of touch on it earlier, is the importance of storytelling. I know another yes. thing that we both feel really strongly about. And yeah. uh, as you were saying, you know, being human beings as being connected, you know, the the importance of that. So again, maybe you just sort of touch on that in terms of storytelling, both the importance of it maybe in uh, the way you uh, run your agency or just in your own personal life, uh, whichever way you want to go. Yeah. Um, hmm. Without, <laughs> to avoid rambling, I would say storytelling for me, it's, it's like air, it's it's blood, it's essential, and it's what connects us to each other. Um, but one of the things that I've gotten really, um, I've gotten really uh, obsessed with is, it's not just the story that you tell, but it's the point of view in which you tell the story. And for myself, um, I've been learning that, uh, or at least been my struggle as, as a career creative professional and kind of trying to find my own story or my own voice in this world was really being able to be affirmed in my identity, be affirmed in my lived experience and my perspective, my unique perspective. I've been to places, I've seen things that only I have, have and the stories that I can tell 
because of my perspective are just as important and just as valid as any other stories that are being told. And I think that for myself, but I think that for everyone. And so how do we really partake in storytelling, but really be able to uh, be uh, gracious and and considerate of everyone's point of view as they tell the stories, even if we don't agree with their point of views, um, because point of views are literally that person's point of view, right? It's not ours, um, but there is um, a reverence within storytelling that I'm trying to really trying to figure out with my agency, trying to figure out with my own personal um, aspirations, what I think about my family, all those things. Um, and so it's just something that I, 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 as a craft, as an art form, it's something that I try to every day get better at, uh, whether it's um, reading books on the best designers in the world or um, being in community with people who have similar uh, lived experiences as mine, but are very diverse in their in their career professions, right? Um, it, it, it's just really important to cultivate my own story, cultivate the story of the work that I'm doing, and then be open and receptive to uh, the stories that are in my world, essentially. Fantastic. That's lovely. Thanks so much. Now, Chris has popped some questions in. I don't know who wants to ask them to you himself. I will bring him in maybe later on towards the end. But Chris is just saying, what are some brands that you think right now are doing incredible work? That's a great question. Uh, okay, so I think, okay, this is random, but I was on LinkedIn and I saw um, Shay Shack come into the fold. And Shay Shack recently hired an influencer that used to work at Chick-fil-A uh, because the influencer at Chick-fil-A, she, she worked at Chick-fil-A and uh, every day she would share her free lunch that she would get um, on the job. And Chick-fil-A would say, hey, employees can't, they, they crack down on her. Um, employees can't post about like company stuff unless, you know, you're paid to do so or whatever. Shake Shack saw that as an opportunity to say, oh, you all don't want to allow her to post. Well, she's going to post about our new chicken sandwich that we're, get, that we're, <laughs> they're about to promote. And it was something really smart about it. It was like a very defensive marketing tactic, um, and an advertising tactic, but I think the brand um, express the willingness to listen to what was happening in culture, figure out a way to champion and support the people who were, you know, shaping culture in a very interesting way, and then just give her the platform to do what she does best. Right. Um, and so that was an example of like, I don't know if Shake Shack is doing the best, but like that move right there was like, that was chess. I, I really like that one. Nice, um, yeah. And when the two brands yeah. are bandying off against each other, there's always something really appealing always about something. that. <laughs> uh, I think I think Arby's uh, social media account has been just the highlight of the last like few years for me. Just, you know, kind of their, their innuendos and the way that they kind of use comic and comedy relief and um, and all the things about, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of another brand. Um, I don't know when a brand gets to the stage where it decides, yeah, our our brand in social can have its own identity rather than being a reporter. I'm not quite sure about this, you know, rather than being just a reporter of the facts about like, for example, here, Ryanair has a fantastic Twitter account, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever we think about Ryanair and, you know, but... I, I'm quite intrigued as to how that jump comes about where the yeah. the the brand decides, no, we're not just going to be saying new product launch or congratulations to, we're actually going to become an, an item, a, a voice, a voice ourselves. Yeah. And it's a risk, you know, um, because some people might like your voice one day. Some people might not like it. And we've right? seen or it many times go wrong. Many times. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about, because I'm a huge NBA, uh, American basketball fan, like a huge one. And I'm watching the NBA playoffs right now. And I am kind of obsessed with what's happening with this player who's in the Minnesota, like Timberwolves. His name is Anthony Edwards. He has a sneaker deal with Adidas. And his sneaker is actually starting to feel like the Jordan kind of uh, you know, the Jordan ones are uh, the the first edition of the Jordan shoes. 
because of his personality, because of the marketing style that has come with his shoe uh, release and how he's performing on the court. Like all those different things are playing a factor for Adidas basketball, which nobody really was checking for Adidas basketball like that is becoming a thing again, you know, and, and it's, and, and, and we're, we're, you know, we see all the time that like charismatic personalities who are at the helm of brands oftentimes drive those brands to develop a unique voice in a way that, you know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Right. So we could say like Kanye West and Adidas, well, yeah. sometimes it works. Yeah. It's a risk. Sometimes it doesn't. So, um, I, but I don't want to, critique <laughs> <laughs> we'll call out uh, air the movie as a great yes. thing to watch yes. you know on that exact exact subject which is fascinating wasn't it the, it was the story behind which i'm sure many of us didn't know you know that full story behind the product yeah and you know what it was actually also fascinating to um because i have mentors in that space um who were at um jordan brand or nike around that time and have, you know, even more detail around that scenario, what was happening, the evolution of that relationship with, you know, Nike and, and, and Michael Jordan. It, it's just a fascinating myth mythology, you know, that, you know, you find something interesting at every corner, you know. And um, talking about films, and I just see Chris's comment there, are there any you know, books or media or uh, podcasts that you that particularly in, inspire you or you like to listen to regularly for inspiration? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to turn back here because there's a couple books here that I've really, hmm, let me see, what's the most inclusive? Okay. So um, a book, um, I always forget the title, but it's by my one of my mentors, uh, Kevin Bethune. Oh, I and know what you mean. Imagining design. Imagining design or imagining uh, reimagining design. Reimagining right. design. Yeah, sorry. So I'm rereading that book at the moment, and Kevin. First of all, Kevin's life story is very akin to mine, and how he ended up in design, and um, you know some of the 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 takeaways that he's had within industry. Um, but that book it, right now is my meditation on what does it mean to innovate within a space where design is technically we're supposed to be the innovators, but sometimes we 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 are not positioned or we're not um, considered the 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 drivers of of innovation. So, like, how do you, as a designer or even as a multidisciplinary person, um, really kind of um, commit to innovation um, and, 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 and spark change within an industry, within a, a company, et cetera. So um, he, like his, his, his book is really um, helping me to develop more of an audacious outlook of what I'm doing right now, because as an entrepreneur, there are high highs and then there are low lows. And like, you have to have a steady through line of optimism and and almost delusion if you if you, if you really want to make it through and so um, his book right now for me has really helped me um, um, just become a little bit more uh, audacious in what I'm doing so that's one book uh, that I'm reading right now I'm thinking I've done a couple of memoirs lately um, but I don't know if I want to share those next. Um, <laughs> Let me see. Uh, we podcast. we will support that. Kevin Bethew's reimagining design is yeah, yeah. is a super read. I've uh, interviewed Kevin. He's a very interesting mm. person. Oh my god, uh, incredible! Uh, as you say, um, he has a very interesting story himself. Yeah. Um. Actually, um, my former boss has a uh, really great podcast. Um, her name is Morgan DeBond, and it's the journey with Morgan DeBond. So okay. I tell you, she is a entrepreneur savant. This woman has had multiple businesses. Um, she built the media company that I, that I was the first creative director for. And um, she did much of the work that she or much of the achievements that she had made in her life came at like age 26, 27. And so she's on the other side of having had a really successful career. She's a mother now and her podcast and how 
she gives practical tips and advice for entrepreneurs, particularly creative entrepreneurs, is really fascinating. And her partner is also a creative entrepreneur that I've developed a relationship with. Um, and so I, I would recommend her podcast as well. Um, and it's just really practical. That's really good. I'm just seeing a comment earlier on from Peter. Thanks. Peter Smith said, great stories are a Trojan horse for terrific discovery. Beneath the surface, facts and details can be found an absolute treasure trove of excitement. Absolutely. I think we'd all second that, uh, wouldn't we? Um, so, and Chris is managing to drop some really useful uh, links in there with uh, design books. So that's really great. And he's shared a link. If you see that in the chat there at the side, a link to that podcast that Quinton uh, has mentioned. Um, Natalie, I might even bring Natalie in if she's uh, sure. got the bandwidth. Natalie, if you're still with us, you've dropped a really great question in there. Would you like to uh, put your question to Quinton? Sure. Hi, everyone. Hi, Quinton. Um, well, I was just wondering if you had any more tips for sort of how to encourage creativity and wondered like, how much of creativity do you think is born versus like what's learned and what you can develop yourself and um, I put a comment in saying I once got told that I didn't demonstrate enough creative rigor mm. in an interview and it massively threw me at the time because I was like oh I'm naturally a really super creative person and I was sort of writing poems as a child and short stories so now I'm always interested basically in all things kind of how to be more creative and how to get your spark back if you think you're lacking and you don't feel very creative that day that's Absolutely. great. Thanks, Natalie. Wow. Okay. I mean, the first thing, um, you know, I'd say the first tip for encouraging creativity within yourself, um, I've realized that rest and space are the most important things as I'm pursuing creativity. What I mean by that is I, I'm a workaholic. I tend to work a lot. I love what I do, but I experienced a little imbalance. I think I have a little bit of an addiction to work. Um, and so what I would would oftentimes do is work so much that I wouldn't leave myself space to be present and space to have enough energy to be able to be curious or ask myself those questions and be really present in, the, in that exploration. So uh, rest was really important so that I could have energy and be recharged and be clear about how I want to pursue creativity. So rest was important, but then the space being really diligent about protecting time for creativity. So one of the things that my co-founder and I have done is we said, okay, no client meetings on Monday um, and very few client meetings on Friday. Like if we can help it, you know, if we're trying to win business, then we'll take calls whenever we need to. But, um, but protecting time for us to be able to, do deep work, have conversations, go out and meet people, really try to pursue creativity is super important. So I'd say rest and uh, space are super important. And then, you know, I was almost a little offended you know, by the interviewer that said that you didn't exercise enough creative rigor because, you know, I guess, you know, I, my first question is what qualifies rigor? in your mind um, and you know, is it a consistent output that is commodified or, you know, you participate in capitalism in a particular way? I don't like, so my whole kind of energy was like, oh, I'm mad for you. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think for yourself, um, rest and space oftentimes li lend itself to uh, a rhythm that you can kind of get into and you'll have consistency within that rhythm, but you have to establish being able to take care of yourself, but then being able to have enough space for yourself to explore. That's great, thank you. Absolutely. That's a great question. Thanks so much, Natalie. Um, now, and, and Dandango has commented, I don't know who's a question. Oh yes, just thanking you for the conversation. Allowing time and space to be creative is so important. That's, yeah, that's really lovely. Um, so I'm just gonna go back again now before we wrap this up uh, to another thing that I remember you commenting in our uh, video in the Advertising Essentials course, 
when you're talking about including design thinking as a foundation mm. to connect with audiences. And um, I, mean, I don't know if it's that the term is something that we're sort of comfortable with in this particular field of work. Often I talk about it and you get this blank face from people. So maybe just to wrap out, we could have a little chat about how you use design thinking, what you understand it to mean, and maybe how we can uh, push it out to a sort of wider audience, maybe, as we're talking about inclusion, inclusion of language rather than our niche words in the industry. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a great question. I'd say I oftentimes, I don't want to say replace the phrase design thinking with this thought, but I think of design thinking to be more um, applied compassion. And what I mean by that is compassion as a, in its definition is to be empathetic, but to be able to take action on that empathy. And so you have to be truly empathetic when you're using design thinking skills. So being able to really understand the pain points, but also understand the ecology of the pain points. So you're not just looking at the person in pain, you're looking at the systems that are governing that pain and being able to address all of those things. And so the empathy allows you to go in and really understand um, and the compassion, the action um, is to take what you've learned within that empathetic state and start to design ways to solve those problems and to si solve those problems inclusively and sustainably. So all these like buzzwords to me are like, uh, I, you know, I, I understand them and I think that I also am very conscious about, I am not an academic of design, I'm a practitioner. So sometimes the way I express my thoughts around design can seem a little too practical or a little non-academic, but you know, for me, design thinking really just comes down to compassion. I love that. I think that feeds in very well, as I was saying to your conversation earlier about inclusion and about needing people with all different approaches to life within the room uh, when we're working on projects so that we can be sure that uh, we're reflecting all the different points of views. It's been such an interesting conversation with you. And uh, I'm going to bring uh, Chris in to join us, if he doesn't mind just to have a, a couple of words for you and obviously just to thank you for joining us here today in this 42 Courses Speaker Series. So just over to you for a minute, Chris. Yeah, thanks so much. No, I, I mean, I always love listening to hear, hear you talk. So thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I, I, was, I was saying earlier when you were answering um, Natalie's question, I wonder what your definition of creativity is because it seems to mean a lot of different things to different people. Mm. Um, I'm happy to share mine if you want. <laughs> yeah, you know, because I think you exercise curiosity within creativity. Uh, creativity is such a, uh, I don't want to be too flowery, but like creativity is just, I don't know. It's what makes us all human. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, you know, I would love to hear your definition because I don't know if I've ever really articulated what I believe creativity is. I've I've felt it. Uh, yeah. I've tried to embody it. Um, okay. And, um, you know, I could say these are all the things that I'm doing around creativity, but creativity is something that I feel very deeply. Mm. I, I think it I think you're on to something. I mean, mine mine is something around, you know, creativity is is a kind of unique ideas that have value in either maybe a commercial sense or an emotional sense. Because you can have great creativity in art, yes. and great art normally is something that that makes you feel something deep inside. Mm. But then, if you're looking at you know from an advertising or marketing sense, great creativity can also have a have a big commercial value as well as it can make you stand out. And you know, even if that commercial impact isn't directly related back to that ad or whatever, it 
it can still oh. can still help. I don't know. There's there's something really interesting about the idea of the, you know, the relationship between ideas and curiosity and creativity. Um, so something I'd love to think about more. But um, you know, value is that that word value is standing out to me. Mm. Um, because value, when it moves from it being intrinsic to extrin extrinsic, that is to me creativity flowing because, you know, yeah, and and value value can be quantified, but it also can be immeasurable. You know, mm. so value in itself is really interesting because. Um, it is based on perspective, but it also but, it can be very much so um, exchanged. It's like an energetic, right? Um, but anyway, yeah. but that was really that was really fascinating. I want to meditate on I, that. I, right? I, lo I love that we've wrapped up on such a philosophical note because I'm hoping that everybody now here today on this call will go away. From this, we'll all be ruminating through the afternoon on what what do we think is creativity. So that's a, I think, a really fantastic point to end on. So I want to thank everybody who's joined us on this call today. We really appreciate you giving us your time. We want to, of course, thank Quinton for taking the time to join us and share so many great insights today it's been a pleasure to listen to you quentin and uh so yeah we love that you joined us thank you so much do all join us again for other talks that we do for 42 courses speaking to interesting people Ooh. and we hope we'll see you again and plus, to you chris well plus if if anyone wants to do something really random we just launched a course called biomimicry which is i don't some people probably don't even know what biomimicry is but it's um it's pretty fascinating i i, I don't know whether quinton have you, you heard about biomimicry uh-huh the nerd in me has yeah it's, yes, um, absolutely yeah sort of how how you can learn to innovate and design better by learning lessons from nature you know nature has been sort of innovating for many years um so yeah why not try and take inspiration from that it's a, a kind of interesting topic that, or a subject that I guess has been around for a little while, but probably is definitely not mainstream yet. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, somewhere interesting if you want to get some inspiration from, I think. Fantastic. Yeah. Let's hope we can get a speaker on with us soon to talk Quinn, about biomimicry. About yes, Quinton? Oh, no, no. I just wanted to quickly interject. <laughs> you, may, you, ref you made me reflect on when I was uh, in school, uh, MIT has a media lab. And there was an exoskeleton project that was happening. And biomimicry was the th theme around that because they use, um, you know, um, uh, natural existing sh shapes and forms that they found in, in the sea world to create this bioskeleton that would help uh, arthritis patients be mm -hmm. better. So it was like a, a sleeve uh, that they created. Um, they 3D printed it and all that stuff. But anyway, yes, that's what it made yeah. me think of. Maybe we'll, we'll see some some more biomimicry stuff at Cannes this year. Who, who knows? Um, who knows? Yeah, I mean, we're going to see a lot of AI stuff. Yeah, I'm yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, uh, it'll all be AI. Uh, yeah, thank you so so much again, and thank you everyone for joining. I really appreciate it, and I'll, I'll share the recording far and wide. Um, um, thank you again. Thanks so everybody. So Thanks everyone thank for, so joining much for joining us, and have a good rest of the day. See you all now. Cheers. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.